Praise God. Well, listen, we're, we're continuing on in the book of Romans. We've been doing a little bit of a series on the book of Romans. Real quick, I don't want to go through everything that we talked about last week, but I do want to kind of get us up to speed. Last week, we had to know something. So we talked about knowing, and this week, we need to reckon, okay? So when we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. It doesn't mean like it meant, you know, whenever you talk to an old country fellow that you used to know, you say, well, I reckon that the store is down the road over yonder. You know, like in other words, I suppose. That's not really what the word means, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the other things we talked about was the fact that there were three baptisms in the Bible. That was really where we got started before we got into having to know something. Right? And then under no, we talked a little bit about ignorance. We said ignorance isn't bliss, and that was like a little play on the word uh, that says, did you not know? But then we, we were talking about specifically the things that we did need to know, okay? And under the three baptisms, the main one that we talked about was really baptism into Christ. And that right there is uh, different than what you would expect if, you, if you've never really been taught this before, it's not the same as water baptism. Water baptism is an outward representation of what happens spiritually and inwardly when you're baptized into Christ. So when was I baptized into Christ, preacher? When you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ the first time and you responded by faith to that message, the Bible teaches that the old man that you were that was born of Adam, so we can just go ahead and draw it out, we'll get that out the way. The old man that you were that was born of Adam. Because you see, in Adam you were born broken and dead, right? And so that's what really, to be truthful, that this was all about. And I know I've explained this before, but even for the people that are maybe watching on video, I'll let them see it. I got this lady to make this out of styrofoam. It looks pretty good. Really, she did a good job. But that's what that means. Adam, the old man. See, Paul calls him, calls him you know, the old man. It describes the sinful nature. Your first birth physically, you were born, your father was Adam, and you were born with a sinful nature. I use this terminology loosely, almost like the idea of a spiritual DNA. You were born with a spiritual DNA that had a sinful nature connected to it. And so therefore, an apple tree grows apples, and so therefore, a sinner sins. Sometimes nowadays people don't want to hear about the word sin, but the fact of the matter is we were all born in the same boat. I'm not over here stepping on nobody's toes or poking at anybody in the eye that I wouldn't poke myself in the eye on. I was born of Adam too, and I have a sinful nature too. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Good news is, is that God had a prescription, amen? And the prescription was the sending his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, amen? So you were born of Adam, the old man, but then you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? And what you had to have heard if you really heard the gospel. Now listen, there's a lot of people out there that are saying that they're preaching the gospel. And the word gospel literally means good news. And I've said this many times before, but the good news starts with bad news. And the bad news is, we've already said it, you were born of Adam. Adam fell and he spread, if I could say it that way, that disease known as the sinful nature throughout the entirety of the human race. And so if somebody didn't tell you that, then they didn't really tell you the gospel. If they just kind of like motivated you and gave you a good little speech and made you feel good about yourself, but they were scared to talk about sin and they were scared to talk about the blood and they were scared to talk about the sacrifice of Christ because they were concerned that it was going to make people feel uncomfortable and they might not want to come back to the church, then guess what? You just wasted an hour of your time because you didn't even get the Bible. They're, they are not communicating for God. God, when God calls a man to communicate, he wants that person to, or woman to speak what his word says. Amen. Could let my word preach. Amen? Amen. And so anyway, but if you did hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, what you heard was that you were a sinner in need of a savior and that Jesus is your savior. And so when you believe that this baptism miracle, baptism into Christ took place where you became one with Jesus. See, just as in water baptism, you become one with the water, in, G, in, in baptism into Christ, you become one with Him. And that, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that was really where we went next, our interconnection with Jesus. But, but in a baptism in Christ, the difference is baptism of water, I, we, you know, about once a year, we get the tank out here, we go to the park, and we start dunking people in the horse trough. It works perfect. Okay, it's a perfect size. Uh, but 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 that's that's the preacher 
baptizing the believer into water. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit you're baptized into one body, talking about Jesus. So when you get saved and put faith in Christ, a supernatural miracle takes place where the Holy Spirit baptizes you or puts you in Christ. All right? And then what happens later on in Romans, and we covered it last week, was that we become one with him. We're baptized into his death. His burial, I'm putting the little rest in peace thing, and even as he was raised from the dead, we too should walk in newness of life. Now, one of the things that I talked about was the fact that there's a, there's a death side to the cross, right? And then there's a resurrection side to the cross. Yeah. And now, I'm not talking about physical resurrection. This is true. Because he rose, we will rise with him. But what I'm trying to talk about today is resurrection life. Amen. I'm talking about resurrection life on this earth today, being filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit, giving you strength and grace to forge forward and to do the will of God. Amen. Each and every day as you face the trial and tribulations of life, you're, you can be empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not doing it in your own strength. Daddy used to say, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, boy. Hunker down and get her done. And I'm all about that. I, believe, I went to a, a restaurant yesterday to get something after I worked out to eat. And this, when I sat down, the table was a little bit dirty. And it wasn't that big of a deal. And I'm not trying to make a big deal about it. But the girl that obviously had that table before, she was sitting there counting something. And she apologized. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's really not that big of a deal. It wasn't that big, big, you know, big of a mess. It's no, no problem, no stress. And then she kept going on and on about it. She obviously felt really bad about it. I mean, it really wasn't a big deal. But then she says, I mean, would you give me a break if I told you I've been here since 530? I said, no, not really. <laughs> I mean, because I'm just saying, like, all I'm trying to get at is, I mean, you were, I, would, I told you I really didn't have a problem with it. But I'm not really going to give you a break since you were here since 530 because you really ought to perform the same way when you showed up as when you leave. <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. She said, I like that. That's good. I said, well, good. So then a little bit later, I said, but I will commend you for working hard because ain't nobody wants to work hard no more. I don't even know why I went off on all that. Other than to say, Hallelujah. Yeah, you got, God wants to give you grace, amen, to move, to go through. Just God, God give that girl some grace to show up at work and to work hard throughout the day. And even if customers don't treat her right and treat, if she was a believer, she'd have a supernatural flow of grace. The problem that we run into is that the majority of the world and even the majority of the church doesn't know how to tap into the grace that is that wants to be that God wants to supply to them and so therefore would they find themselves the world's already knee deep in it they're looking for everything that they can get to just kind of escape and to numb their pain and their situation but the church also falls into that trap and so we begin to look to other things to get us through I'm not going to sit here and list them all off. I could. I'd probably make enemies. You know, uh, I'm not scared to, but I've done it so many times. You probably already got stuff popping up in your brain. If you got stuff that you do, and listen, the preacher preaches to himself. If you got stuff that you do in order to escape and to get through, and it's not trusting in Christ and receiving the grace that flows from that, then you are trusting in something else to get through, right? And, and listen, it's not to say that God's, yeah, God can't, still can't work with that. He can. Yeah. But, he, if, but if the Holy Spirit lives in you, he will be whispering in your ear, let it go and trust me. Yeah. Let it go and trust me. And listen, this... This walk with the Lord is a process, amen? amen, and we should be progressing. So, but one of the things that we talked about too, so that's the three baptisms, and there's a death side to Calvary, and the death side is, is to understand that the old man born of Adam died, and the resurrection side of Calvary is to understand that there's new life in Christ, amen? amen. And one of, the, one of the main things that we needed to know was that we were united with him. Meaning there was an interconnectedness by faith in the mind of God anyway. And that's how we have to really today when we get into reckoning, that's a big part of what we're talking about in the mind of God. We have to understand that what we're talking about here is how God sees things. The problem that you and I have is that we don't see things the way God sees things. We see things the way we see things. God, that's the whole point to God's word is, is that he wants us to begin to see things the way that he sees it. He wants us to trust that what he says in his word is true. And when we begin to do that, we begin to see the results taking place in our lives. 
So one of the other things that we needed to know was that sin has no more power over him. That was actually point number three. We probably mentioned some of this, but I want you to go ahead and put Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 7 through 10. And we'll read it. I'm just, I'm just warming us up to get us to the part we're actually talking about this morning. But he says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but that in he liveth, he lives unto God. There, there's really so much here that you can't even really hardly, if I started dissecting it, we would spend so much time. But one of the things that we need to understand is, is that there's a knowing that needs to take place. And the knowing is that we are in union. Scholars call it the vital union. I used to draw this. It looks a little weird sometimes if I don't draw it just right. But I'm going to be careful to draw it right. And so it's kind of like I used to put a little umbilical cord. I made up, I thought I made up a word one time, but it was actually a real word, umbilicated. We're, we're umbilicated to Jesus. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a cord of grace, a connection. We're interconnected with him. Scholars call it the vital union. When we came into faith with Christ, we, be, we became one with him. And through this death, burial, and resurrection, we're now in him. The Bible teaches that Jesus is seated in heavenly places and we're with him in heavenly places. In the mind of the father, the deal is done. It's all over with. But he's left us. In the game, if you will. That's why they're going to play the game today. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, everybody's like, oh, Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. You don't even have to watch the game. Well, hold on a second. That's why they play the game. And, and the truth is, but in the mind of God, for the believer, it's done. The victory is secure. Why? Because Jesus secured it. Amen. 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 And it's a done deal. But God has allowed us to partake. Now, when I first got a revelation of that, I was kind of blown away. God has allowed all of this to partake. I don't want to go off on a whole bunch of stuff, but you know, I've noticed before that you have even different kinds of employees. When you see people that have owned a business before, and then and whether it failed or whether it was successful and they're an employee again, a lot of times they'll work a whole lot different than what they did before they ever had a business. Because they understand a lot of things that are going on. They understand a lot of things that, the, that the, they're, they're buying in. If, they, if, if people buy into an organization, you know what? They'll go back outside and they'll pick up the piece of trash that they saw in the front flower bed, even though that's not in their job description, because it's just the right thing to do. It doesn't look good for the place of business if there's trash in the front. You want customers to continue to come. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say God is allowing us to be part of what it is that he's doing regarding the eternal kingdom. He's allowing us to partake in it. To be truthful, many times when we do ministry, I've seen this all too often. I've been, do, I've been in the, with the Lord for quite some time. I've been to churches. I've been in leadership. And some of the things that you begin to notice is that sometimes people, whenever they work in ministry, they start to get burnt out. They start to get burnt out and frustrated. One of the main things, that was a big reason why I didn't really want to be in full-time ministry. People can judge me all they want to about that. They think it's all because I just love the, the money that I make. I like the money that I make and I like the, the job that God gave me. But let me tell you something, it's bigger than that. I want to be, if I'm going to ask people to volunteer, then I want to be able to say that I did the same thing that they were doing. And that's one of the reasons that I take the kids. Sometimes because and that's one of the reasons I split it up. I didn't want one person doing it all the time and never being able to get to church. Even still, you can still get a bad attitude. I can't fix people's hearts. You can't fix my heart. I can't fix your heart. If you're not careful, the devil will cause a root of bitterness to get on the inside of you. And I don't know, if you had to take the kids once every three months, you still wouldn't be happy about it. That's between you and the Lord. If you're not careful, the devil will come in with a root of bitterness and he will begin to cause you to become frustrated. Listen, you're either working for the Lord or you're not. Amen. Amen? All right. So anyway, let's move on. I don't know really where that, all that came from, but anyway, it did. And so what we needed to know, though, was that we were united with Christ. There's an interconnectedness with Jesus. And guess what? Grace flows through that and gives us strength. But in Romans chapter six, where we read seven through ten, it used the word sin on multiple occasions. And more specifically, it said death has no more dominion over him. 
Death is not his Lord. He resurrected from the dead. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He moved out of the sphere of dead people. Listen, sometimes I get a little too technical, but one of the things that I want you to understand is that in the mind of God, all this stuff is very legally oriented. In other words, Satan, God created Adam without sin. Satan caused Adam to sin. Adam, now a sinner, caused sin to infect the entirety of the human race. Now it requires a sinless man to die because Adam was created without sin. You can't die for your own sin. I can't die for my own sin. We deserve death because we were born in sin. Jesus, who had no sin, died in our place, and death had no right to hold him in the grave. He actually said, he said, I have received a command from my father to lay my life down so that I might pick it up again. Had he not received the command from his father to be able to die, he wouldn't have died because Jesus had no sin. It's the wages of sin that equals death. Jesus paid the death wage when he died on the cross. The resurrection was inevitable. The only way the resurrection couldn't have happened is if Jesus had sin or he hadn't atoned for every sin. Because he paid for every sin, because he had no sin, the resurrection is the proof, the receipt paid in full, that Calvary worked. That God's plan worked. Amen? But one of the things that I wanted you to know about the word sin, about what we just read, is that it has to do with the sinful nature. And he says that he died unto sin once. And the idea there is that, it's, it, is that in the Greek, I'm not trying to get too too uh, technical on you, but in the Greek, it's got this thing called the definite article. It would be written something like ha hamartia, something like that. This ha is the, all right? And it means the sin, not just a sin, not an act of sin, not a verb of sin. It's not shooting dice behind the galley or, or you know, smoking pot behind the bar or, you know, whatever, sleeping with the wrong person. It's not just acts of sin. It's the sin. It's the principle of sin. It's the sin nature that you receive from your father, Adam. So Jesus didn't die to pay the penalty of your individual sin. He died to break the power of sin that was over your life. Amen. It's kind of like a deal where you had a factory that produces a car. The sin nature is like a factory that produces sin. And I know I've said this many times, but Brother Larson used to say, you can take all the alcohol off a shelf, but if you don't destroy the factory that produces it, then the shelves will be full again. What Jesus did at the cross doesn't only remove the, the empty the shelves, but it destroys the factory. Or at least it makes a change to the factory. It puts it on hold. That's really how we ought to say it. It's kind of like the lever is pulled to the off position, but it can be bumped back. Let's, let's not be confused here, right? Uh, you know, I used to like to say this too, that you know what? You can muzzle a biting dog, but you didn't really take the bite out the dog. What Jesus did takes the bite out the dog, all right? And so I wanted you to see that. It's talking about the sinful nature. As a matter of fact, in Romans starting at like verse 21, uh, 521 all the way through chapter 6, 19 times the word sin is used and only once is it used as a verb. It's very important that we understand that because it's the sin nature that's the, really the problem. And, and, and so we need to have some knowledge and some understanding about some of these things. All right, let's go ahead and get started on this morning's message. Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. So we needed to know some things. We needed to know we were interconnected with Jesus. We became one with him in his death, <clears throat> his burial, and his resurrection from the dead. We needed to know that death has no more dominion over him and that he also dealt with the sinful nature. But look what it says right here. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. So Jesus isn't the only one that died forever unto sin. He, he, but you also, because you're still interconnected with him. Does that make sense? Just as you were interconnected with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, what he has, you have. You're co-heirs with him. He says, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. 
For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. A lot of information there. And to be honest with you, almost every point has two sub points. So we'll just preach till about a quarter till and see what happens. Amen. All right. <laughs> point number one, from knowing to reckoning. I likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So once again, last week we talked about knowing something. This week we're talking about reckoning something. And last week it started with ignorance, right? Because that was the word. It said, did you not know? And in the Greek language, the idea was, was that you were ignorant or nobody had taken the time to explain it to you, right? But that there was a progression of knowledge to the point where you were actually able to see now. To see what it was God was saying as far as being one with him and all those other things, right? Um, so we're going from knowing to reckoning. Now, if you'll remember, whenever we stu started studying this, in Romans chapter 4, the, a couple of words were used on a multiple occasions. You remember that? Imputed and counted. Y'all remember that? God counted Abraham as righteous. David said, blessed is the man to whom God does not imputeth his sin. The main point that I brought out to y'all was those two words mean the same thing in the Greek. Why the translators use different English words for it, I don't know. But the idea behind those words is a mathematical term. And the main idea is that it means that God put righteousness in Abraham's account based on his faith, right? So one of the things that we need to understand is you're not saved by works, you're saved by faith. Not, work, not by works lest any man should boast, amen, but it's by faith, all right? And so one of the other things that I want you to know, though, too, is this, is that it's not just that God put, put righteousness in Abraham's account, but it's also, it's kind of like a mathematical term. The word in the Greek is logizomai, where we get the word logarithm. It's mathematical, all right? It's almost like the idea is two plus two equals four. That, that's factual is the point that's being made. What God's saying about Abraham is, Abraham believed God, God put righteousness into his account, that's the facts, and God's not changing his mind. Two plus two equals four, that's the facts. You're not going to change that, so what you need to do is, you just need to go ahead and humble yourself and live according to that truth. Mankind may try to change it. Two plus two doesn't equal four anymore is what they'll try to tell you. A man ain't really a man, a woman ain't really a woman, but that's a bunch of lies, right? Two plus two does equal four, right? And, and but, so that's one of the things I want you to see is that God says, when you put faith in Christ, righteousness goes into your account. It doesn't matter what you feel. We're not talking about your feelings. Oh, but I don't feel righteous, preacher. If you, and if you knew what I did last night, that's not what we're talking about right now. What we're saying is God accepts the sacrifice of Jesus as payment for your penalty, and he allowed an exchange to take place where you, he took your guilt and gave you the righteousness of Jesus, and based upon your belief in that plan, God says you're righteous. That's, that's the scripture right there, all right? Like the solution to the math problem, these are the facts about what God believes regarding the believer and his new position. Now, when we use the word reckon, God is asking the believer to believe for himself and to reckon what God already believes about him. So he said it in Romans 4, you're righteous. Now God is asking the believer to reckon or believe the same thing about himself that God believed about him. Amen. Before we were ignorant and didn't know, but now we know, so we must reckon. And what is it that we must reckon? All this stuff that we already talked about. That we were one with him in Christ. We were baptized into Christ. We were baptized into his death. We were baptized into his burial. The old man was done away with. The new man was resurrected. Amen. And, and, but, but listen, the believer who lives his life based upon the fact that he possesses the divine nature. So when you got saved, something happened. God did a, caused a change to take place to the sinful nature in you. And he planted his divine nature on the inside of you. Amen. 
If you want some scripture for that and you're taking notes, I don't see anybody writing, but Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 talks about that. The, the fact that there was going to be a new nature that was going to be given to mankind. Amen. Because he, he was going to place his spirit on the inside. Jesus said it in John 14, that the spirit of truth would be in his people. So that's the first adjustment that the Christian has to make. Counting upon the fact about the power of the indwelling sinful nature is broken and the divine nature has been imparted. It's talking about the difference between death and life. I'm talking about here today. Put Romans 8, 11 up there for me. I like this scripture because it talks about the spirit of God and how he operates in our lives. Right. He says, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Yes, it's true that the spirit of God dwelling in us will also resurrect us physically from our death. But that's not even really what it's talking about here. It's talking about the same spirit that raised Jesus up physically will also give life to our mortal bodies, to this temporary body that we live in on this temporary earth to strengthen us as we're on the journey. All right. That was point number one. Point number one was uh, that we needed to uh, from know go from knowing to reckoning. And now point number two, ask the question, who are you working for? Let's take a look at. Um, it says in the next verses where it says, let's sin, therefore. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. I think it's probably verse 12 or 13. Let not sin therefore reign. Uh, Romans chapter 6. Try, try 12. Is it 12? Yeah. I forgot to put my verse. Sorry. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Once again, two sub points under here because it's talking about two kind of two different things. First off, it's talking about the reign of two kings and then it's talking about the mortal body. At least those are the two main points I wanted to take out of this little passage of scripture. The reign of two kings and also the mortal body. Point was, though, who are you working for? See, the idea of reigning is, the question is, who is your master or who is your king? The idea of reigning is that sin is operating as a king in people's lives, and kings have jurisdiction over their realm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And they give demands to their people. And the people that sit under the leadership of the king bid the service of the king. The king gives a decree. You can see the little public crier, right? He runs, scrolls the scroll. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. This is what the king says. And he gives a decree. And then all the little peasants start doing what it is that the king does. The, and this is what it's talking about. Don't, are you going to yield your members to unrighteousness? Or are you going to yield your members to the things of God? Right? And so it makes demands over their lives. And when sin is reigning as a king in a person's life, the members or body parts, that's what we're talking about here. The body parts are being utilized as tools or weapons for the kingdom of darkness, because that's what the word instruments means. If you go back, it said, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. The word instruments right there in the Greek language means a tool to prepare something or a weapon of warfare. For the child of God, when he yields his members to the kingdom of God, to the Lord, God's using him as a tool to build his kingdom upon this earth. In, a, in the sense of, uh, you know, I don't believe in dominionism, that we're going to fix everything on this earth and then Jesus is going to come back. But in the sense that we're doing the work of the Lord, he's using us as hands and feet and mouth and eyes. Amen. He, his spirit dwells in each and every one of us. Um, but, but, but whenever we use our members to do the work of the, the kingdom of darkness, we're, we're also helping to build the work of the enemy. Amen. I mean, I listen, some of y'all might not have really worked for the devil, but I did. I mean, I was kind of like a little pawn in the game, but I worked for the devil. I hustled for him too, man. It's like, oh, you give me this, give me that, do that, and running around and kind of doing all the little devil's business. And the truth is, is that it was just helping to destroy people's lives. Amen. And there's a whole lot of different levels to that. 
And in a similar fashion, you know, the, 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 the text is really going to exhort us to say, hey, if you ran with the devil, you ought to be more so running with the Lord. Amen. If you worked for the enemy, you ought to be working for the Lord. If you gave him your devotion, you sure enough ought to be giving your devotion to Jesus. Amen. You need to use your members for that. And we can see examples of uh, people using, you know what I'm saying, their members uh, in, in Old Testament, New Testament. I mean, the Apostle Paul is a great example, right? I mean, his feet carried him up and down Asia Minor. Pre his mouth preached the gospel. Praise God. His hands wrote the Holy Writ. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I, I mean, we see David dancing before the Lord, bringing the presence of God home. But also David used his members at times for the kingdom of darkness. And each and every one of us can say the same, right? Unfortunately. But the reality, that's what we're talking about here. Who, who will you yield to, right, is the question. Um, the second thing that I wanted us, uh, that I wanted to point out was that, is about the mortal body. He said, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, right? And, and he said, uh, Right here, he said, yeah, let sin not therefore reign in your mortal body. And so the idea of mortal is that I put right here, don't follow a king that won't last. The emphasis is definitely on the sinful nature here. But in the Greek, I was reading behind this one Greek scholar. He says the way that it's broken down in, this, in the original language, in the sentence structure, the emphasis is really more on the mortal body. And the reason why is because the sinful nature doesn't have a way to operate if it doesn't have a body to use. Right. And so there's an interconnection that say and, and the idea is, why would you want the, the body is mortal, meaning it's decayed. It's temporary. Everything that this body does is temporary. And so you have a choice to submit yourself to one of two kings. And one. Why would you want to submit to a situation that's temporary and decaying? Why would you want to serve a temporary master? Right. And instead, when you could serve and present your members to the king of righteousness, which will ultimately result in an eternal reward, amen, and eternal uh, eternal life. All right, that was point number two. Point number three is grace will hold you more accountable than the law ever would. So where it says right there, y'all going to have to help me with the verses. What, what verse is it that says, for sin shall not have dominion over you? 13? Can you 14. put that up? 14. Put 14 up there. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So sin has no more power because we're not under the law. And since we're, But then the next question is, since we're not under law, can we just go, can we just go ahead and sin a little bit? And Paul says, God forbid. So, so let's take a look at the first part. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So the power of sin is the law. Can you put 1 Corinthians 15, 56 up there? I always used to like this scripture. Look at this. This, is, this makes it so clear. And people don't realize you can try to live your life according to a set of rules and when you do that, like, listen, there's a lot of preachers that preach that way. You're supposed to live like this, and this is how you do it. You do this, this, and this. And when you put your faith in this, this, and this, instead of Jesus Christ and him crucified, you now take yourself out from under grace and put yourself under law. And now you engage a whole different scenario where there's no grace to walk in freedom and victory. Look what it says right here. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, just for the purposes, because this is so cool right here. Why don't you go to, I didn't, I didn't have a plan, but go to 1 Corinthians 1.18 for me real quick. So the strength of sin is the law. Now look at this. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So the law is the, is the power of sin, and the message of the cross is the power of God. Why? Because God's grace and presence and strength flow to the weakened believer as he believes in what Christ has done. Hallelujah. That's how God, in your, in your weakness, Paul, my strength is made perfect. 
Amen? All right. Let's, let's take a look. So we're talking about the fact that we're, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. It's no longer your Lord. It's no longer your King. Why? Because you're not under law. You're under grace. Amen. We looked at the fact that sin, uh, that, that the law gives strength to, to, to sin. Let's look at Colossians 2, 14 and 15. I love this passage of Scripture too. Kind of long and wordy a little bit, but look at this. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What do you think that means? Handwriting of ordinances right there. The law. So blotting out the law that was against us and which was contrary to us. Why was the law contrary to you? Because you couldn't keep it. <laughs> it called you guilty. Amen. Ain't nobody in this room kept the law. Because even if you felt like you kept the first eight commandments, you wanted somebody else's car and you wanted somebody else's woman or you wanted somebody else's man, if you the opposite. So it says right here, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So, so we'll go back, I'm sorry. So the law was contrary to us, but Jesus took it out of the way. Now, Jesus made it clear. He said, you think I've come to abolish the law? No, but to fulfill it. So he didn't. But what he did was he took the law out from over your head and it no longer has jurisdiction over you and it's no longer calling you guilty because now he paid the price because he's the righteousness of God. So he nailed it. Look what he did. Look at the cross again, man. People want to get around and all oh, this message of the cross, man. Look, this is the gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He nailed the law to the cross with him. When he died, the law died with him. The law regarding righteousness, you can't be righteous by trying to keep some rule. It's a bunch of external religion, man. People walking around in churches, even in this town here, I'm telling you, people sitting under law and they act like they got it all together and they're trying to teach their people that it's some kind of external, uh, superficial. No, God's looking on the inside of the heart. He sees everything. He Listen to me. He sees everything. Amen. Praise God. Let's go to the next verse. It says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. It's talking about, when it says spoiled principalities and powers, it's talking about demon spirits, fallen angels, mm -hmm. the forces of evil. Spoiling them means he destroyed them and he took the victory home. Mm -hmm. said, what he, how did he do it though? Look at this. He triumphed over them in it. What do you think that is talking about? That's right. It's talking about the cross because the an, it's an an, the antecedent to it. It, it, it it's, it's referring back to the cross. He nailed the law to his cross and he destroyed the power of sin through the cross. Amen. 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 So sin shall not have dominion over you. It's not your Lord. Amen. Why? Because when Jesus died in the sin, he died in the sin once. He didn't just pay the penalty for the actions of your sin, but he paid. He destroyed the power of sin. He took it away from the enemy. Amen. Now, if believers were still under the law, it would be impossible to keep sin from being their master. But since believers are under grace, this is done by trusting the Lord. If, if we were still under the law, it would be like a perpetual guilt hanging over our head. Kind of like a debtor that you can't ever get free from. You ever been in debt before? I've been in debt before. That ain't nothing fun. I didn't even realize how miserable I was. I was like, I had a master's degree in nursing. I thought I was doing fine. And it's just some little electrolytes. Robert was concerned about the color of my water. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, I was driving down the road one day and I heard this guy talking about getting free from debt. And man, when I realized, when he started talking, I realized I was under a burden of debt. And I, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If, you, if you've never been there, then you can't relate. But if you've been there, it's, it, it, it's like a, you feel like you're, you're imprisoned a little bit. You can't get out from under it. You know? And that's kind of like what, the, that's what trying to live under law does. I, I, I think I got a little revelation from this when I was studying this last night. In the sense, I always used to tell y'all that before I really surrendered to what I was learning as far as the message of the cross, I felt like I constantly had a cloud of guilt following me around. But I realized now that a big per reason why I always felt that cloud of guilt was because I was trying to perform for the Lord and I kept, for I kept failing God. I was trying to perform better in order to thinking I was going to earn righteousness or I was going to please God through what it was that I was going to do. But I never really could accomplish what it was I told him I was going to do. If I was going to read four chapters, 
then I never really got to four. I could only read two. If I was going to go to three services a week, I really only made one. You understand what I'm getting at? And I was trying to perform, and because I was failing in my performance, I constantly felt guilty because I was trying to live under a law-based program. Now, what I'm trying to get at is this. Since I've learned how to submit to God's plan and received grace in order to be strengthened, I seldom ever miss a, a, a service unless it's planned, right? I know it's a little different for me. I'm the preacher, but, you, you know, or, you know, I, I read the scripture because I love the scripture, right? And, and, and we should be praying and we should be seeking the face of God because we love. Yeah. We want to hear from the Lord, yeah. not because we're trying to earn something right. from God. Yeah. Amen. All right. And so, so you're not, Lord, sin shall not have be your Lord. It's not your king anymore because you're not under law, but you're under grace. And then the next question is, so what then? Shall we sin? God forbid. Shall we sin because we're not under law, but instead under grace? You know, one of the main point that I wanted to make was that, the, that grace will hold you more accountable than the law ever really could. The reason why I say that is because the law tells you where to stop, but grace tells you before you even start the journey not to go. I used to use this story a lot. I mean, it's not, look, it's not that bad. I mean, I, was, I wasn't, thank God for Jesus. I try to tell somebody something. I wasn't a preacher though, all the time. But I remember one time I was already a Christian and I went to, I went to uh, Holland to survival school because uh, I was working in the oil field. And so I'm in a new country and we're kind of staying in this rural area, nice hotel, but it's kind of in the countryside a little bit. And it's about 40 minutes from Rotterdam. And so all of a sudden, they, the guys that I'm with, they're playing. Now, these guys are a bunch of yahoos, man. Like, look, they drank the plain dry. I'm talking about it. I didn't drink a drop. They all thought I was this big nerd, you know, but I'm like, oh, I'm a Christian, man. I ain't going to drink no alcohol. So anyway, we get over there to the hotel, but I'm thinking, you know, look, I, I don't want to just stay in this hotel room all night. I want to go see what's going on, man. They, they, this bus is probably going to bring them to go to a bar room, but I'm going to go check out what's going on in the town, you know, get, get me a sandwich, you know, just walk around. I don't mind being alone. I'm good. <laughs> so the little butt dude, it was all planned. I mean, dude, this is straight up tactic of the enemy. And use, this is a perfect example of the enemy using people's members to work his kingdom of darkness because it was already pre-planned that this bus was going to drop these old boys off in front of this particular place. And so when I get out, I'm like, so, because everything else was dark. And I'm like, there ain't nothing else open. This is it. But let me, let me, I forgot to tell you this part. When I first got ready to get on the bus, the Holy Spirit spoke so loudly, get off the bus. I took two steps further towards the back of the bus. The Holy Spirit spoke a little more loudly, get off the bus. And like a dog, I'm just telling you, whooped puppy dog with my tail between my legs. I kept walking and I sat down in the chair. Now, had I listened to the Lord to begin with, none of this mess would have ever happened. And God made it clear, I'm telling you. Sometimes God will speak very clearly, and he said, get off the bus. Anyway, next thing I know, I'm in line like a little robot, behind, standing behind everybody else. Five dollars, sir, to buy your ticket to get in, you get five drinks. Okay, so and so now I'm already gone to, I was going to walk around the town, and to now I'm in the line with everybody else. And so I'm going to spend five dollars, but I'm not going to drink alcohol. By the time that I get across the threshold of the door, one Jack Daniels and Coke isn't going to hurt anything. And by the thing, next thing you know, I don't mean to be weird or whatever. They had naked women coming out everywhere and they all dancing around. And it's like this. And now when I look back on it, I know it's kind of weird to say it on tape. I definitely believe that these women were like trafficked. Like they, these people held onto their passports, you know, it, like a major major sin pit that how in the world did you end up in the midst of all of this and all I can tell you is is that I didn't obey and, and that I found myself I know that there was a bigger part <laughs> that a bigger point than what I wanted to make regarding that but it's perfect for point number four because point number four is that slaves obey mm -hmm. and we really and truly we shouldn't be obeying the voice of the enemy we should be obeying the voice of the Lord. Amen. And the truth is, is that whenever you find yourself under that type of situation, oh, that's what I was talking about. Grace will hold you more accountable than the law ever will. Before I ever got get ready to start, start off on that journey, the Lord told me, get off the bus. 
I know it's wrong to fornicate. I know it's wrong to smoke dope. I know it's wrong to drink alcohol and get drunk. I know it's wrong to do all of these things. But God wanted to hold me accountable to his voice before I ever even got started on the journey. Had I just listened to the voice of the Lord, I would have never ended up in the circumstance to begin with. That's the point I'm trying to make. Grace will hold you more accountable than the law ever could because now the indwelling divine nature of the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and he's communicating to your spirit man and he's giving you wisdom. Amen. But if we don't listen, Lord help us. And that's the next part. Slaves obey their master. And it says right there, where, where's that verse? It says, know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants. What is that? 16. 16. Verse 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey his servants you are? Listen, that night, thank God it could have been worse. I don't, I don't want you to think that I did. Every, I mean, it is what it is. I've done worse than that before. But here I was a Christian. Okay, and it didn't get as bad as it could have got, but it got pretty bad <laughs> to the point where the next night they were like, hey, dude, you're in round two. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I ain't going back with you, dude. <laughs> oh, what you talking about, man? You was doing it. You know, and then, you know, all I could, this is all I could do. This is what I said. I said, you know what? I'm supposed to be a Christian. I failed the Lord, failed you miserably. I'm a pitiful excuse for a Christian, but I ain't going back with you tonight. <laughs> Done. Praise Amen. The Lord. You got to shut it off sooner or later. You can't just keep on going. <laughs> Slaves obey. And, and listen, whenever, know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servant, you are, to, you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Two thoughts here. Yielding to righteousness or yielding to sin. You know, I was thinking about this. Both yield signs and stop signs are the law. However, a stop sign doesn't allow the exercise of your will. In other words, it commands that you stop. A yield sign, though, on the other hand, requires that we make a judgment based on distance. I don't have to yield in this situation or I do need to yield. It's kind of like our free will. You know, we got a choice to make. Do I yield or do I not yield? I got some freedom here. Well, whenever you yield yourself... To sin, you basically what you're, you see when you yield at a yield sign, you're giving someone else the right of way to use the road that you could have been on. Correct. And, and in a similar fashion, when you yield yourself to sin, you're yielding your members to be utilized for the purposes of unrighteousness. But the problem is, is that it never stops there. Yielding to righteousness. What I need you to know, Jesus is a good master. Amen? Amen. Paul called himself in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, you don't have to turn there, but he called himself a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word servant there literally means a slave. Paul called himself a doulos, it's a slave. Now, we're going to get into a little bit more next week, but, you know, he's speaking in human terms so that we would understand things. But the idea that he's taking comes from uh, Deuteronomy 15, and we don't have to go there either for sake of time. Deuteronomy 15 was the year, it was kind of like a mini jubilee. The jubilee was from the 49th to the 50th year. And they call this the Shemitah. People are talking about that now. From the 6th to the 7th year. It was almost like every 7th year was a mini jubilee. And specifically, if a Hebrew man had been poor and sold himself to a Hebrew master, from the 6th to the 7th year, he was released to go free. But the idea behind it was, was that his master was too good. He's like, where am I going to go? Why would I want to leave this master? He's been too good for me. And I've told you all that story before where they'd put their ear up to the doorpost, right? And they'd drive it all through it. And they'd wear it. They'd pierce their ear showing that they willingly submitted themselves to be a servant to this master. And that's really what Paul was talking about. It's like, Jesus has been too good for me. I'm willingly desiring to be his slave. Jesus is a good master. It reminds me of the story in Luke 7. You don't have to go there about that woman. I'm going to tell you the story. Luke 7, 26 through 47. You remember that story where Jesus is in the house of that Pharisee and that woman comes in there? No questions asked. She just bows down at his feet. She breaks that alabaster box. She starts perfer perfuming him. She starts crying all over his feet. She's washing his, his feet with her tears. And they're over there, that, that, that religious leader said, hmm, 
If he was really a prophet, he didn't know what kind of woman that was. He wouldn't let her touch him like that. Jesus, perceiving the thoughts that were in their heads, tells a story about a creditor. This one owed a whole bunch. His debt was forgiven. This one owed just a little bit. Their debt was forgiven. Who do you think loved more? Oh, the one that had a big debt. Yeah, you can understand that. That's why she does what she does. My feet were dirty. You never even let your servant wash them. She hasn't stopped washing my feet with her tears since I walked in here. To whom much is forgiven, they love much. Amen. That's the idea of the do lost slave. That's the idea of one who yields himself to, as a servant of righteousness because he knows that he was unworthy and he's gotten a revelation of the love of the Lord and that Jesus loved him even when he was his worst and picked him up, amen, when he had nowhere else to go. Oh, praise God. The devil, on the other hand, uh, sin as a king is really a hard thing. That's the best. That was the sub point number two under that. You know, sin as a king is a really hard thing. Paul was addressing that the fact that unsaved Romans had offered their bodies to impurity, to ever increasing wickedness. They had voluntarily become enslaved. Whenever you voluntarily Submit yourself to sin. You become a slave of sin. The difference between being a slave of the Lord and being a slave of the devil, God will never hold you against your free will. He's never going to demand that you freely be his servant. No, he gave you free will for the purpose that you would choose him. Amen. The devil, on the other hand, he will hold you in prison. Amen. Now he, and he do, do, will not easily let go. He will hold on to you. He will play every trick in the book to try not to let you go. And the result is, is that and unlike the woman who's bowing at the feet of Jesus, washing his feet with her tears, we end up like the prodigal before we return home. Bowing down by, in a pig pen. Loss of everything. Because that's what sin does. Until we turn and lay our life down to the Lord... What ends up happening is, is that the enemy slowly steals, kills, and destroys everything that it is that we have. But thank God that his mercies are new every morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.